everybody. How are you guys doing today? I'm a little embarrassed. You guys kind of caught me in the middle of getting ready for the ball. In just a little bit, I get to head up to the castle for the big famous dance with the prince. I am really looking forward to it. But I have a few minutes available, so maybe we'll sneak a quick book in before I head off. Now, I feel a little overdressed. So if you guys have some dress up clothes at home and want to join me, feel free to put me on pause for a minute. Go pull out one of those fancy schmancy outfits, get it on, and then come back again. So today, we have just enough time to talk about one of my favorite books. Can anybody guess what it is? If you're thinking Cinderella, it's not. How many of you have ever heard of the book Ella Enchanted? Now, this book is a little tricky because they came out with a movie called Ella Enchanted that Disney put out. If you have seen the movie, you don't know what's inside the book. In the movie, the beginning is very similar. The end is mostly similar. In between all these pages though, there are a lot of changes that happened. So it's always good to remember, I love watching movies. Movies are so much fun, but the movies and the books oftentimes aren't the same and have lots of different things between the pages of the book. So if you've seen the Disney movie, don't go, oh, I already know what's going on and hit the stop button. I'm gonna know if you hit stop. It's not the same. We're gonna talk about some of those differences as we go. So I have an important question for all of you. How many of you like birthdays? I love birthdays. I love to celebrate them in my class with my students. I love to celebrate them with my kids at home. And I like to celebrate them for me. So how many of you guys have fun celebrating your birthday? One of the things that traditionally happens on a birthday is this right here, presents. Do you guys like to get gifts? Do you like to give gifts? I like both. I love to get gifts. And I love to give gifts as well. In our book, it's all about a gift that was given to our wonderful Ella at birth. Should we find out what's so special about that gift? I think we should. Okay, let's start together. Now, when you think of a gift and you're getting ready to make out that wish list. What kinds of things would you ask for? Now, if I were to tell you that a fairy was going to come to your birthday and grant you a gift that only a fairy could give you, what would you ask for? Ella didn't ask her fairy for a gift, but the fairy decided to come and grant her a gift. Here we go. This is chapter one of our story. That fool of a fairy Lucinda did not intend to lay a curse on me. She meant to bestow a gift. When I cried inconsolably through my first hour of life, my tears were her inspiration. Shaking her head sympathetically at mother, the fairy touched the tip of my nose. My gift is obedience. Ella will always be obedient. Now, stop crying, child. I stopped. Father was away on a trading expedition, but our cook Mandy was there. She and mother were horrified. But no matter how they explained it to Lucinda, they couldn't make her understand the terrible thing she had done to me. 
I could picture the argument, Mandy's freckles standing out sharper than usual, her frizzy gray hair in disarray, and her double chin shaking in anger. Mother, still and intense, her brown curls damp from labor, the laughter gone from her eyes. I couldn't imagine Lucinda. I didn't know what she looked like. <sighs> she wouldn't undo the curse. Why does Ella call a gift of obedience a curse? It was supposed to be a gift. So why do they keep calling it a curse? When you think of the word curse, do you think that's a good word? I don't think it is. Hmm. Maybe we should keep reading and see if we can come up with an answer. My first awareness came on my fifth birthday. I seem to remember that day perfectly. Perhaps because Mandy retold the story all the time. For your birthday, she'd start, I baked a beautiful cake, six layers. Bertha, our head maid, had sewn a special gown for me, blue as midnight with a white sash. You were small for your age even then, and you looked like a china doll with a white ribbon in your black hair and your cheeks red from the excitement. In the middle of the table was a vase filled with flowers that Nathan, our manservant, had picked just for me. We all sat around the table. Father was away again on business. I was thrilled. I watched Mandy bake the cake and Bertha sew the gown and Nathan picked the flowers. Mandy cut the cake. And when she handed me a piece, without thinking she said, eat. The first bite was delicious. The second bite was still good. I finished the slice happily, but when it was gone, Mandy cut another slice. That one was harder. When it was gone, no one gave me more, but I knew I had to keep eating. I moved the fork to the cake itself. Ella, what are you doing, mother said. A little piggy, Mandy laughed. It's her birthday. Let her have as much cake as she wants. She put another slice on my plate. It felt sick. I felt frightened. I couldn't stop eating. I kept taking bite after bite after bite. And the more I ate, the sicker I got, the more upset I got. But I couldn't stop. Oh, every bite weighed on my tongue and felt like a sticky mass of glue as I fought to get it down. I started crying <laughs> while I ate <laughs> my cake. Mother realized first, stop eating, Ella, she commanded. I stopped. Anyone could control me with an order. It had to be a direct command. Oh my goodness. So, poor little Ella is presented with a magnificent birthday cake. So at first, she takes a few bites, and of course she enjoys it. Who doesn't like cake? But the problem was, the curse was given to her that she would always be obedient. So when the cook said, eat, she can't stop eating this cake until it's all gone or until somebody lets her stop eating. So if you had to suddenly eat this entire cake and couldn't stop, how would you feel about halfway through, three-fourths of the way through, do you think you could eat this entire cake? Now remember, our sweet Ella was only six years old when this happened. 
she wasn't very happy. And as much as she liked that cake and the idea behind it, after eating so much of it and feeling kind of sick to her stomach, it actually made her scared to wonder what was going to happen to eat the whole thing. Hmm. Are you guys starting to understand why she calls it a curse, not a gift? I think I am. How would you like to obey every commandment that was ever told to you? Let's find out some more. It had to be a direct command, such as put on a shawl or you must go to bed now. A wish or request had no effect. I was free to ignore those. I wish you would put on a shawl or why don't you go to bed now? But against an order, I was powerless. If someone told me to hop on one foot for a day and a half, I'd have to do it. <sighs> Could you imagine? Could you imagine if somebody said hop on one foot and you had to keep going and going and going and going and you couldn't stop? Even if you were tired, even if your other leg was sore, what if you wanted to tip over? But you couldn't stop. Not until somebody told you it was okay to stop. Even if you commanded me to cut off my own head, I'd have to do it. Ooh, could you imagine? Could you imagine? So it isn't just about discomfort of eating an entire cake. We're getting tired hopping on a foot. Somebody could actually make you hurt yourself. Now I really understand why this is a curse. This is not a gift that I would want. This isn't even a gift I would want anybody else to get. As I grew older, I learned to delay my obedience, but each moment I delayed cost me. It resulted in being breathless, nauseous, dizzy, and even other complaints. I could never hold out for long, even a few minutes, and I was in desperate struggle. I had a fairy godmother, and mother asked her to take the curse away, but my fairy godmother said, Lucinda, who gave me the gift, was the only one that could remove it. However, she also said it might be broken someday without Lucinda's help. But I didn't know how. I didn't even know what my fairy godmother looked like. So poor Ella just had to keep on living with this horrible curse. Instead of making me docile, Lucinda's curse made me a little bit of a rebel. Or perhaps I naturally was, and it was just a coincidence. Mother rarely insisted I do anything, and father knew nothing of the curse. But Mandy was bossy, giving orders almost as often as she drew breath. Kind orders, or those good for you kinds of orders. Bundle up, Ella, or hold this bowl while I feed my eggs, sweetheart. Has your mom or dad ever asked you to put a coat on before going outside and you didn't want to? Well, just think, Ella didn't have a choice. They would just tell her and she would have to put that coat on. Oh, when Mandy would absentmindedly give me an order that she didn't mean to, I would remind her by saying, do I have to? She'd reconsider and reword what she was asking me. When I was eight, I had a friend, Pamela, the daughter of one of the servants. One day, she and I were in the kitchen watching Mandy make marsipone. When Mandy set the pastry out and added some more almonds, I returned with only two. She ordered me back with more exact instructions, which I followed exactly, while still managing to frustrate her true wishes. 
Later, when Pamela and I retreated to the garden to devour the candy, she asked why I hadn't done what Mandy wanted the first time. I hate when she's bossy, I answered. Pamela said smugly, I always obey my elders. That's because you don't have to. I do have to, or father would be upset. It's not the same for me. I'm under a spell. I enjoyed the importance of the words. Spells were rare. Lysandra was the only fairy rash enough to cast them on people. Like Sleeping Beauty? She asked. Well, except I won't have to sleep for a hundred years. What's your spell? I told her. If anybody gives me an order, I have to obey. Really? What if I give you an order? I have to obey. Can I try it? No, I hadn't anticipated this. I tried to change the subject. I'll race you to the gate. All right, but I command you to lose the race. I don't want to race then. But I command you to race and I command you to lose. We raced. I lost. We picked berries and I had to give Pamela the sweetest, ripest ones. We played princess and ogres. Guess what I had to be. An hour after my admission, I punched her. She screamed and had a hurt nose. Our friendship ended that day. Mother found Pamela's mother a new situation far away from the town of Frell. After punishing for using my fists, mother issued one of her infrequent commands to me. Never to tell anyone about the curse. But I wouldn't have anyways. I had just learned my lesson. Wow. Does that sound like a good friend? I'm sure that she was curious and kind of wanted to test it out. But it would be nice, would it be nice to make a friend do something that they didn't want to do? I don't think so. When I was almost 15, mother and I caught a cold. Mandy dosed us with one of her curing soups. It was made with carrots and leeks and celery and a hair from a unicorn tail. It was delicious, but we both hated those long yellowish white hairs floating around with the vegetables. Since father was away, we drank the soup sitting in mother's bed. If he had been home, I probably wouldn't have been allowed to do that. I sipped my soup with the hairs in it because Mandy had said I had to. Even though I grimaced at the soup, ugh, would you want to eat soup with hair in it? Not me, not even if it was a unicorn's hair. I'll wait for mine to cool, mother had said. Then after Mandy had left, she picked the unicorn hair out and she put them back in the bowl after she had drank it. She was tricking Mandy into thinking she actually left the hair in. The next day I was well, but mother, she was worse. She was too sick to drink or to eat anything. That's awful. Poor Ella's mother didn't get better. And it's really sad because she ended up passing away. And Ella, she was heartbroken. She loved her mother very much, as I'm sure all of you do. But her mom got sick and they couldn't make her better and she ended up dying. Now poor Ella was left without her mom and a dad who traveled all the time for work. So Ella had to gather her things up and wipe away her tears and she went to her mom's funeral where she would say goodbye to her mom for the last time. 
I bet that was a really hard thing to do. Ella was at the funeral and she was trying to say goodbye to her mom, but she was so sad and she missed her mom so much that she got really upset and started to cry. She cried a lot. I think I would have to. In fact, I know I would have done that. Well, Ella's dad, remember, doesn't know about the curse. So he told Ella to go away and calm down a little bit and then try to come back for the rest of the funeral. Now, can Ella disobey? Nope. So she ran as far as she could, still crying because of course she's still sad. And she ended up finding a tree to sit by. And she sat there and she thought about mom and she missed mom and she cried. And she just was really sad. Then something happened. As she sat by the tree, this occurred. Outside the privacy of my tree, Prince Charmant stood reading a tombstone. I had never been so near to the prince before. Oh no, had he heard me cry? Although the prince was only two years older than I, he was much taller and he stood just like his father, feet apart, hands behind his back, and as though the whole country were passing by on review. He looked like his father too, although the sharp angle of the king's face were softened in his son prince. They each had tawny curls and I had never seen somebody that I liked so much. Wow. I had never been near enough to the king to know whether he had a sprinkling of freckles across his nose, but his son did. Mm, this is a cousin of mine, the prince said, gesturing at the tombstone. I really liked your mother. He started walking back toward her tomb. Did he expect me to come with him? Was I supposed to maintain a suitable distance from a royal person? With enough room for a carriage to pass between us, I walked to his side, he moved closer. I saw he had been crying too, although he managed to still look like a prince. You can call me Char. He said, everybody else does. I could. He walked in silence. My father calls me Char too. The king? Th thank you, I said. Thank you, Char, he corrected. Then your mother used to make me laugh. Once at a banquet, Chancellor Thomas was making a speech. While he talked, your mother moved her napkin around. I saw it before your father crumpled it up. She had arranged the, arranged the edge in the shape of the chancellor's profile with the mouth open and the chin stuck out. It would have looked exactly like him if he were the color of the blue napkin. I had to leave without eating dinner because your mother had me laughing so hard. We were halfway back and it was starting to rain. I could make out one figure small in the distance standing by my father's, by my mother's grave. It was my father. Where did everyone go? I asked Char. Oh, they all left before I came to find you, he said. Did, did you want them to wait? I can go and get them back. No, no, I, I don't want them to wait. Oh, wow. Here I was, standing by a prince, but grieving the loss of my mother. That was very confusing. Well, Ella's father ends up coming over and finding her and tells her that it's time to head back to the house where there's going to be a reception. After somebody passes away, sometimes the families invite friends and other family to come over so that they can say, goodbye to everybody again and that they can let the people know how sad they are for them and just kind of visit for a few minutes. So Ella got in the carriage with her father and left the prince there to head back to her house so that she could meet the people that were waiting for them. Now, once she got to the house, she went upstairs to change her dress and she put on the dress that her mother loved the most on her. Do you think that was kind of a way to say goodbye to her mom and to let her mom know that she was still thinking about her? 
I do. Well, Ella went downstairs and she started to say hello to people, but she really wasn't in the mood to talk. However, she didn't have a choice when she had to meet one particular family. Should we find out who it is? Probably. Oh my goodness. There she is standing when all of a sudden I was engulfed from behind by two chubby arms embracing and rustling black satin. Oh, you poor child. We have failed for you. The voice was syrupy. Oh, and Sir Peter, it's just dreadful to see you on such a tragic occasion. An extra tight squeeze, and then I was finally released. The speaker was a tall, plump lady with long, wavy, honey-colored tresses. Her face was a pasty white with two spots of round rouge on her cheeks. With her two smaller versions standing beside her, the younger one also lacked her mother's abundant hair. Instead, she had thin curls stuck tight to her scalp as though they were glued there. This is Dame Olga, father said, touching the tall lady's arm. I curtsied and I knocked into the younger girl. I beg your pardon, I said. She didn't answer me. She didn't even move close to me. She just stared at me. Father continued, why are these your lovely ladies? These are my treasures. This is Heidi and this is Olive. They're off to finishing school in just a few days. Heidi was older than I by about two years. Delighted to make your acquaintance she said, smiling and showing large front teeth. She held her hand out to me as though she expected me to kiss it or bow. I stared, uncertain what to do. Hmm. I decided just to ignore that hand. Olive was the one I had bumped into. I'm glad to meet you, she said. Her voice was loud and annoying. She was about my age but she didn't have a smile on her face. Comfort Eleanor in her grief, Dame Olga took her daughters. I want to talk to Sir Peter. Our hearts weep for you, Katie began. When you bellowed at the funeral, I thought, what a poor thing you are. Um, green isn't a mourning color, Olive said pointing at my dress. Haiti surveyed the room. This is a fine hall, almost as fine as the palace, where I'm going to live someday. Our mother, Dame Olga, says your father is very rich. She says he can make money out of anything. Out of a toenail, suggested Olive. Our mother, Dame Olga, says your father was poor when he married your mother. Our mother says Lady Eleanor was rich when they got married. But your father made her richer. We're rich too, Olive said. We're lucky to be rich. Would you show us the rest of your manner? Haiti asked. We went upstairs and Haiti had to look at everywhere. She opened the wardrobe of mother's room and before I could stop her, she ran her hands over mother's gowns. 42 windows and a fireplace in every room. The windows must have truly cost a fortune. Do you know about our manor? Olive asked. I didn't care if they lived in a hollow log. They only seem to care about money. That's it. That's all these girls cared about. Poor Ella had just lost her mother. She's really sad. And this lady comes with these two kids and all they care about is money. How would you feel if you were Ella? Ella did not like these girls at all. 
She just wanted them to leave. They really were getting on her nerves. Well, this is not gonna be the last time that Ella sees these girls. Hmm, you think that's a hint as to what's gonna happen? Poor Ella, she's so sad and she's relieved when everybody finally leaves. She misses her mother a lot and she's really sad that she had to leave. Oh, mother used to be known as somebody really important. Ella's mom had a special gift about her. A lot of people liked her and she made a lot of people happy. So there were a lot of people that were really sad that day when she left. Everybody finally left and Ella was finally alone. She walked into the kitchen to go and find Mandy, the cook. Now remember, Mandy had been with her her whole entire life and was the only other person that knew about this curse. She was piling up dirty dishes. Seems like those people didn't eat for a week before coming. I never seen them eat as much food, she complained. I put on an apron and pump water into the sink. They never tasted your food before. Mandy's cooking was better than anybody else's. Mother and I used to try her recipes sometimes. We'd follow the instructions exactly, and the dish would be delicious. But it never was as wonderful as when Mandy cooked. Somehow, it reminded me of my mother just thinking about it. I sat and thought about the crazy rug that was in my living room. It almost seemed like the pictures moved. I told Mandy about it. Oh, that silly thing. You shouldn't pay any attention to that old rug. She turned to stir a pot on the stove. What do you mean? It's a fairy rug. A fairy rug? How would you know? It belonged to Lady. Mandy always called my mother Lady. That wasn't an answer. Did my fairy godmother give it to her? A long time ago, Mandy answered. Did mother ever tell you who my fairy god godmother is? No, she didn't. So, um, where's your father? He's outside saying goodbye to everybody. Do you know who my fairy godmother is? Um, um, know what? Who my fairy godmother is. If she had wanted you to know, your mother would have told you. She was going to tell me who my fairy godmother is. She promised she would tell me. She can't now. I am. You're not telling me. Well, who's my fairy godmother? I am. What do you mean? Me. I'm your fairy godmother. Your fairy godmother is me. Here, now taste this carrot soup. It's for dinner. What do you think? Oh my goodness. The cook in the kitchen is Ella's fairy godmother. I wonder why she wouldn't tell her. Isn't that crazy? So Ella, of course, has a lot of questions. So she talks to Mandy and she tries to find out more and more and more information. First of all, she finds out that both her and her mother have fairy blood in them. Not enough to do magic and not enough to be a real fairy but just enough to be extra special and to have special things about them. So Ella begs her fairy godmother, please, please take this curse off me. And her fairy godmother explains to her, she can't. First of all, she didn't put the curse on her. And second of all, in order for that curse to be removed, she was going to have to do really big magic and she didn't believe in doing big magic. Now, if you were a fairy godmother and you could perform magic, why wouldn't you? Well, Mandy explains, anytime you do magic, something else can happen that you might not have control over. For example, if it's raining outside and you want it to stop raining and you wave your magic fairy wand or just say the magic words and the rain stops, you might be happy. 
So how happy is that farmer going to be that was expecting the rain so that the crops would grow so he could feed his family and help the town? Now, if you realize that by stopping the rain, you were hurting the farmer, you decide, hmm, I think I'm going to make it rain and rain nice and hard to help that farmer. So you have it rain again. Now the farmer's happy, but guess what? It rains so hard that your neighbor's roof caves in. Now what? You didn't mean to hurt anybody, but do you understand? The more magic she uses, the more things can happen. So Mandy doesn't use any magic like that. She only uses little magic. Things like giving potions to help you feel better. Or if you drop a bowl and it breaks, putting a bowl back together again so that you didn't have to throw it away. But anything outside of that, Mandy didn't do. So Ella is still stuck with this curse. If you were Ella, how would you feel? Well, Ella's day gets worse. Her dad comes in right after she finds out that she has a fairy godmother as a cook living in the house. And dad comes in and says, Ella, now that your mother has passed, I have to travel all the time for work and it's not good for you to stay here alone. So I'm gonna send you away to finishing school where you can learn to be graceful and learn your manners and find someone to marry. Poor Ella, she's just lost her mother and now she's being sent away from her home. And she is devastated. She is so sad and heartbroken. But dad gives her an order that she will go. What does that mean? It means she's going. Just when things looked their worst, they get even harder. Because Ella isn't going to finishing school alone. Ella is going with the two mean girls that she had just met. You remember those girls? They're the girls that only cared about one thing, money. Ella is heartbroken. The next day she gets up and she starts to pack her belongings and she gets ready to leave. But she can't leave without saying goodbye to her town and her home. So she goes around and she says goodbye to all the favorite places that she likes to visit. While she's out walking, I uh, guess what happens? She runs into somebody. Who do you think it is? That's right, Prince Char. She runs into the prince for the second time in two days. Well, she and the prince get along great. And she even makes the prince laugh and laugh and laugh. And the prince tells her he loves the fact that Ella acts like a normal person around him and doesn't treat him like royalty. Well, just as they really start to get along, the coach comes to take Ella off to finishing school. And Prince Char asks to please write while she is away. Hmm, there always has to be a prince in these stories. Now, let's think about this for a minute. Poor Ella is off to finishing school where she's gonna have lessons in sewing and dancing and how to eat properly and to speak properly. Do you think finishing school is gonna be very fun for somebody? that has to obey everything she's told, I think it's gonna come with some problems. One of the biggest problems happens right away. When Ella is in the stagecoach traveling to fishing school with the two mean girls, Haiti, the oldest daughter, she realizes pretty quickly that Ella is obeying everything she is told to do even gives the girls her money, the only money she has, and gives them her mother's necklace, which is the only thing she has left from her mom. Do you think Haiti is gonna take advantage of knowing about it? If you think yes, then you're right. They get to finishing school, whatever Haiti wants, Haiti makes Ella do. Finishing school is very tough. You're gonna to have to read the book to find out what happens though. But Ella does finally make a friend at finishing school and it is a great friend and one of her first friends she has ever actually had. And they get along great and they have a good time together. The only problem is 
Katie doesn't want Ella to be happy. So she gives an order to, hate, to um, Ella and tells her, get rid of the friend. You don't have a choice. Now, Ella doesn't want to hurt her friend. And she's really sad. And she doesn't know what to do. So she comes up with a plan. She is going to run away from finishing school. And she's going to go find that Lucinda who put the curse on her and make her get rid of the curse. So sure enough, Ella sneaks away in the middle of the night and she goes to hunt down Lucinda. Now she's heard that Lucinda is several days away attending a wedding. And this could be her only chance, her only chance to finally be free of the curse. So she sneaks off and all by herself, she goes on a journey to find that fairy godmother. Doesn't take long until she's in a little bit of trouble. Guess what happens? Our poor Ella is caught by a whole group of ogres. Do you know what they wanna to do to her? They wanna eat her. Remember that cake we were eating? Well, they think that she is gonna be as sweet as that cake and they wanna cook her up and eat her for dinner. I guess that's what ogres do. Oh my goodness, poor Ella. As if things weren't bad enough. Now she's been caught by ogres. I don't know what is gonna to happen to our poor Ella. Should we look at our book and see if we can find out? Let's see what happens. All hope appears to be lost for Ella. And then guess what? A twig snapped behind me. I turned and saw a vision. Six knights carrying rope strode toward me, led by a tall young man. Visions don't snap twigs. And that young man was Prince Char. He saluted me but his eyes were on the ogres. Prince Char comes to the rescue. Ella gets away and is back on the road to go and find the fairy godmother. Now, Prince Char can't come with her. He's gotta take care of these ogres and figure out what to do with them. So he sends one of his men along to help our cute little Ella try to finally break this curse. So Prince Char heads back with the ogres and Ella continues to go and find that fairy godmother. She finally finds her. Doesn't work out the way she wants it to. First of all, she arrives at the wedding in time to see her dad is there also. She hunts down the fairy godmother who put the curse on her. And just as she's about to explain why she doesn't want the gift and beg for it to be removed, she's given an order and she has to leave. So she never gets to talk to the fairy godmother. So she still has the curse on her. Now her dad puts her back in the stagecoach and tells her that they're gonna head back home. But in the stagecoach, her dad breaks even more bad news to her. Her dad didn't do a good business deal and has lost all of his money. He has to sell Ella's home and all the belongings in it. And even worse, he's decided he's gonna marry the not known so nice lady with the two daughters and move Ella into their house. Oh, poor Ella. Every time you think something good's gonna happen, it doesn't. So Ella is sitting in a stagecoach and she's trying to decide, what am I going to do? Haiti, the mean daughter, knows that Ella has to obey everything. So if she knows she has to obey everything, what is her life gonna be like living in their house? She could make her be their slave and there's nothing she could do about it. She could tell her to wash the floors and mop the windows and do everything and Ella couldn't say no. She would have to do everything she's told. Then there's a little issue of Prince Char who Ella kind of likes and well, Prince Char kind of likes her. But how could she be with a prince 
when Haiti could order her to take all the prince's money and give it to her. She could order Ella to live in the, pas in the palace with them and she would have to let them. So Ella is really in a pickle right now. She is about to have a stepmom and stepsisters that aren't very nice to her. And she doesn't know what to do about Prince Char. She really does like him. But can she risk him getting hurt? I don't know what's gonna happen. Now, here's the trick. This book is one that you are gonna have to finish reading to find out how our story ends. So if you want to know what happens to our sweet Ella and find out what happens between her and Prince Char, you are gonna have to get the book and finish reading it. If you have that opportunity, let me know what you think. I can tell you this, there are a lot of surprises between the pages and the story might not end exactly how you expect it. Now, as a family, I think it would be a lot of fun if you guys try to understand a little bit more about how our Ella is with this curse. Have you ever played Simon Says? As a family, you can do this. One person is Simon. Simon's in charge. Simon is going to stand on one end of the room. The rest of the family is going to stand on the other end and they're going to be kind of like Ella. Now Simon is going to give orders and the rest of the family is going to have to follow them. However, you don't have to follow all of his rules. You only have to follow the ones that he says Simon says. So for example, if Simon says, Simon says clap three times, you have to clap three times. If Simon says, shake your hands, you have to shake your hands. Now, if Simon says, jump up and down, but he didn't say Simon says, you don't have to jump up and down. Now, the object of this game is that Simon is going to try to catch you not following his orders when you're supposed to or doing them when you didn't have to. If he catches you, you get to sit out. The last person still standing is the winner of the game. Then you guys can all trade places and try it again and somebody else can be Simon and everybody else can have a turn trying to act like Ella. So that is my challenge for you. I hope you guys had a great time learning about Ella Enchanted today. Now, if you remember, when you joined me, I was a little busy. I have a date at the palace tonight. It's the Royal Ball. And I'm hoping I can meet Prince Char up there. Do you think Ella ever made it to a Royal Ball? I guess we're gonna have to read that book and find out. I hope you guys had a great day with me today. Have a wonderful week and enjoy reading the pages of the book to find out more adventures that our sweet Ella went on. Bye guys, see you later.